Every map tells a story. What does this map communicate to its audience? And what about this map? Each map is depicting the world, but how are they different? And why are they different? Like any language, we must first have a clear understanding of the speaker, in this case the map maker, and the audience, in order to decipher the intended message. Orientation, size, and placement are just a few elements that can be manipulated for a desired purpose. Objects placed in the center of maps have always played an important role in guiding perceptions of our world. The standard Mercator projection was a favorite of British Imperial map makers as it placed the United Kingdom in the favorable location on the Prime Meridian. Its size was also inflated, along with Greenland, while Africa was diminished, indicating dominance and superiority during a time of imperialist conquest of Africa. The Gall-Peters projection depicts a more accurate representation of landmass size and location. But even then, there's no reason why maps should be oriented with north at the top. In Stuart MacArthur's Universal Corrective Map of the World, he orients the map with south at the top. Australia, Africa, and South America immediately stand out and appear as more dominant in this projection. But again, consider the map maker's bias. Take one guess where map maker Stuart MacArthur lives. Australia is near centered in the map, above every other landmass, in the coveted location of dominance. A simple change in orientation can completely change the map maker's message to the audience. This isn't a unique concept. Medieval tripartite maps would always orient east on top. In fact, the term orientation derives from orients, which is Latin for east. These circular maps divided into three landmasses reflected a religious-based view of the world, as Jerusalem, the city of Jesus' death and resurrection, was located in the center, and the believed location of the Garden of Eden was located at the very top. These maps were also referred to as TO maps, because of the circular shape of the map, which represented the world, and the shape of the letter T, which divided the landmasses and also represented the cross of Jesus' crucifixion. In Salter's world map, Jesus is even depicted above the world, holding a TO globe in his hand. Every map combines science, aesthetics, and technique in order to represent a spatial understanding of things, concepts, or events in the human world. But what about maps depicting fictional worlds, such as Lord of the Rings' Middle Earth, the Chronicles of Narnia's Narnia, and Game of Thrones' Known World? Imagine that you know nothing about these worlds and their storylines. Now, what information is being communicated to the audience through their respective maps? Maps are subjective, and like any form of art and design, they have stories to tell. The most successful maps are selective, leaving in information that is important to the agenda of the cartographer and excluding the chaos of other details that are irrelevant to the narrative. There is a beautiful economy of design to a good map, and many maps can help us decode the belief systems of its audience. A map maker must set the agenda for their map. That will inform the traits they choose to include. Those traits may be physical, such as roads or land masses, or they may be abstract, such as location names and boundaries. Immediately, we can see the title of these maps in the selected area of inclusion. The title for the known world map features Westeros in larger print than Free Cities, calling attention to the idea that this story will take place predominantly in Westeros. The border around the Narnia and the known world maps gives some insight into their stories. In the known world map, we see symbols of a lion, stag, wolf, and dragon, which may represent different territories or competing houses. In the map of Narnia, they too have four symbols along the edges, but there's also an image of a lion centered at the top and at the bottom. This prominent placement over the entire map suggests reverence and authority, reminiscent of the religious tripartite paintings, which had Jesus centered above their maps. All of these maps are shown pictorially, meaning that they use vague representations instead of scientific accuracy. They all use the ancient form of hill profiles, which are simple illustrations of mountains and hills in profile to depict relief, placed across areas of approximate location. They do the same for trees. It offers an aesthetically pleasing appearance, but they aren't used today in modern maps because the results aren't very accurate. The choice to use this antique style tells the audience that these stories take place in ancient or medieval times. All three maps show relief, trees, towns, and rivers, but the map of Narnia depicts particular landmarks, while the maps of Middle Earth and the Known World depict roads, both choices offer insights into their respective stories. The wardrobe, the lamppost, cherry tree, the stone table. These items are significant enough for the map maker to include them, so they must be crucial aspects and landmarks to the story of Narnia. There is greenery scattered throughout the center of the map, but set off to the side in what appears to be a desolate area is Witch's Castle, presumably our antagonist of the story. The castle is placed at the highest point of the map, conveying its position of power over Narnia. Flowing directly out of the witch's castle, a river points to another place of interest, 
which is camp. It's safe to say that these two locations are connected. But interestingly, the map maker decided to create a mirror image of another camping castle, Aslan's Camp and Kerr Paravel, respectively. With the Fords of Varuna separating these two sides, the audience can quickly grasp that, while the Witch's Castle houses the antagonist, Kerr Paravel must play host to the protagonist. In fact, a stretch of land between these two halves is titled Battlefield, clearly foreshadowing a looming conflict. In the maps for Middle-earth and the known world, the roads and paths suggest a story revolved more around movement and physical journeys. There are many locations scattered throughout both maps, which offers more possibilities for division and conflict and the importance of identity. King's Landing looks to be an important location, as many roads lead to it. This must be a pivotal location in the story. There's also the Wall on the higher edge, which is the only man-made landmark depicted on the entire map, signifying its importance. On the other side of the wall is the haunted forest, and then a seemingly desolate, lifeless area. These dark forces point to a larger central conflict in the story. In the map of Middle-earth, the relief stretches across the entire map like a giant dragon, its head forming Mordor. Mordor is surrounded by mountains, making it appear well-guarded and ominous. Even the shape of the dragon seems to be pointing towards Mordor, implying that's where we're headed in the story. Locations in Middle-earth blend English words with other unknown languages, which shows that this world has a mix of cultures and races. The fact that there's a scale included hints that distance plays an important role, further pushing the archetypal journey. This process of examination merely scratches the surface, but already you can begin to see the agendas and messages that maps can offer to an audience. Maps have a language unto themselves, and when we're able to tap into this language, we're better equipped to understand the stories of our world and the world of our stories. Hey everyone, I'm here at Park City hanging out around Sundance and Slam Bams Film Festivals. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed it, share it with your friends, like it, leave me a comment below. Entertain the Oak puts out two new videos a month, so if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe below. That way when I drop a new video, uh, you can make sure to watch it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.